Hey you guys, gals and bums, welcome back to A Few Bad Men. Today we have episode 5 of Murder Incorporated. But before we get into that, I want everybody to put your drink in the air. We're celebrating 20,000 subscribers. All right. Thank you to everyone from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate you guys so much you don't know. All right. There's been a lot of buttons left in the streets and a whole lot of thumbs broken. And I thank each and every one of you. I remember hitting 100 subscribers. This never gets old. So thanks again. And let's keep putting the pressure on that subscriber gang. All right. So without further ado, A Few Bad Men presents Murder Incorporated, Episode 5, Old Sparky. When Happy Mayoni was first told that Abe had begun to sing, O'Dwyer told him that Relis admitted to the murder of Irvin Shapiro back in 1931, but he said he was not alone. Do you know anything about that? Happy blurted out, Oh yeah, did he tell you that Maya was f***ing his wife? And that every time he kissed her, it was like he was by proxy? Did he tell you that? Happy had a right to be mad. After all, it was Abe's idea to join up and take on the Shapiros. Happy was already entrenched in East New York. He didn't need Abe. And now Abe was about to take the stand and give the testimony that will put him in the electric chair for killing Whitey Rudnick. Rudnick was Abe's friend after all. They asked Happy to help out. His grandmother was dying. He should have been with his family anyway. O'Dwyer knew that he had to keep his canary safe. They would not be in jail. The mob could get him even in there. There had already been reports of two killers from L.A. who were in Brooklyn to bump Relis off. So O'Dwyer made arrangements with the Half Moon Hotel on Coney Island. The Spanish-style hotel was built in 1927 on the Coney Island boardwalk in an attempt to lure vacationers away from Atlantic City. That plan didn't work, and by 1940, the hotel was facing foreclosure. They agreed to allow the Brooklyn DA to use the entire east wing of the sixth floor to house the Canaries. A bulletproof steel door where the peephole was erected at the end of the hall leading to the wing. The Squealer Suite, as it became known, contained 10 rooms. Abe lived alone in room 623. Charlotte and Bernstein stayed next door to Abe in 622. Allie TikTok Tannenbaum and Mickey Sykoff shared 626 across the hall. Three shifts of police were assigned to watch the stoolies around the clock. When the trial of Happy Mayon and Frank the Dasher Abandando began, the two were brought into the courtroom wearing handcuffs and ankle shackles. At 10.30 a.m., Burton Turkis gave his opening statement. He said that, they would prove that the police responded to a radio call on May 25, 1937 and found a man in an automobile parked in front of a Jefferson Street house with 63 ice pick wounds in his body and a rope and a rope tightly wound around his neck. Frank Abandondo lured George Whitey Rudnick into a garage where Happy Mayon and Pep Strauss were waiting for him to club, stab, and strangle him. As soon as the door was closed, the trio set upon him with the ice pick struck him in the head with a meat cleaver, and finally, a rope was pulled so tightly around his neck that his purple tongue protruded through his clenched teeth. Rudnick's body was then jammed into a backseat of an automobile. To remove all traces of the murder, Turkis said, the men cleaned the ice pick and cleaver and scrubbed the garage floor. We will prove, without a doubt, that the two defendants on trial, along with one other, killed Rudnick. The defense did not give an opening statement. The first to take the stand was Whitey's mother. The short, squat, white-haired woman shuffled past the jury to the witness stand. She answered all questions with a quiet yes. Never making eye contact with the men who murdered her son. Patrolman Schneider said he responded to a radio call and found a white male lying on the floor of a car with his head up against the right rear door. There was a wound in his head about three inches long and about one inch wide at its widest part. A rope was around the deceased neck, wound very tightly. Schneider's partner, Detective James Riley, identified the rope when it was presented as the same one he saw on the victim that morning. The clothesline was submitted into evidence with no objection from the defense. Next, Happy and the Dasher watched in silence as Dr. M. Edward Martin, Deputy Chief Medical Examiner, testified that the body was dead for about 8 to 10 hours before discovery. The murderous pair seemed to pay more attention as the doctor described the wounds as if they were reliving the event and taking pride in their work. The doc said 17 of the stab wounds punctured the lung and heart. The cause of death was asphyxiation by strangulation and the multiple stab wounds. The defense declined to cross-examine the witness. The next day, it was Dookie's turn. He took the stand under heavy guard and talked for over an hour. He told how he and Pretty had stolen a black sedan under the orders of Pep and then delivered it to Happy at his garage at 2310 Atlantic Avenue. 
where several days later, Whitey was killed. He told the jury that he had known the pair for about four years and that the day after he stole the car, Pep yelled at him. He had instructed Dookie to steal a car outside of the neighborhood. But that night, Pretty told him, to hell with Pep. I know a place we can get a car and not get in trouble. They went to a garage in Brownsville and stole a car. Turkis asked him, what if he refused to steal a car? Dookie said, what do you think, I'm going to get myself killed? The defense called for a mistrial. The judge denied the motion. Under cross-examination, Dookie admitted to leaving school after the sixth grade and not having a legit job since he was 16. He asked if he received $2,000 from Abe as a wedding gift. He could not recall. What do you do for a living? The defense asked. I'm a Shylock, Dookie said. Who set you up in this business? Big Harry. His brother gave me some money to get started. He said that him and Pretty were Shylocking up until the day they were arrested and still owed about $600 to Pep. Did you ever kill anyone? No. Did you ever kill a man? No, I didn't kill anyone, but I was there. Was that Red Albert? Yes. Did the DA promise you he would not persecute you for that murder? How could he? I didn't do it. I was just there. Would you lie to save your life? No. Was that as true as everything else you said? Yes. Told to tell the truth. Did the DA promise you anything for testifying? No. He only told me not to lie and he would recommend me to the judge. He said, tell the truth. Did you ever take orders from Rellis? No. Dookie admitted that him and Pretty had 16 pinball machines in operation when they were arrested. When asked if Relif gave you permission to operate those machines, he replied, no, Big Harry gave his okay. That next day, A. Relis was transported to the courthouse in an armored car. He took the stand wearing a gray double-breasted suit, white shirt, and a red tie. While twisting a handkerchief in his hand, he told of how he plotted with the defendant to kill Whitey, who stooled to the police. Abe sang for an hour and a half. He told how him and Pep wrote the letter that misspelled friend trying to help out Lepke. He sang about coming into the garage and witnessing Pep stab Whitey in the throat with an ice pick after he let out a sound. He said before he had started to talk to the DA, him and Happy would sit together in the Christian science meeting and Happy would tell him his plans to eliminate anyone who could hurt them. Abe tried not to make eye contact with his former partners who stared at him. They were surrounded by three guards, as was Abe. Abe told how it was Pep, who came to him and said that Whitey was talking. Then they went to see Happy and the Dasher and said that Whitey should be hit. He told of his role the night Whitey was snatched, and how he and the Dasher waited for Whitey, and that it was Frank who took Whitey to the garage. And after the murder, he described how Happy and the Dasher cleaned the garage of the blood with water and a broom. How Julie Catalano was given instructions to dump the car and not drive too fast. And how he and Mayon followed the car in his own and took Julie back after they dropped the car off. The next day, Julie Catalano took the stand in a blue suit, white shirt, and red tie with white polka dots. He backed Abe's story, twisting his hands and slamming him on a chair arm during his colorful testimony. He even got a laugh from his old pals, happy in a dasher. Sure, I seen Rudnick get killed. When I walked into the garage with Abe, I saw Strauss, Mayon, and Abandando, and a stiff on the floor. I looked at the guy, and I saw that it was Whitey Rutnick. He had known Whitey for over 11 years. The dasher tells me to get the Buick. I do. He tells the same story of Whitey not fitting in the car. He went on to say that on the morning before Whitey's death, he saw Happy, and Happy asked him, where you going? He said, I'm going home to get some sleep. Happy said, stick around. I need you. For what, Julie said. Happy exploded. He said, what the hell's the matter with you? Do you need to know everything? He also described going up to Happy's family's house that evening and saw the family there. He said, what happened? Happy said, my grandmother's dying. Then he was told to hang around for a while. Go get a drink and I'll come and get you when I'm ready. He got his drink and sat in the car with Joda Baker, who owned the garage. Julie said he was in the truck with Joda Baker when he saw the Dash and Whitey pull up to the garage and go inside at around 4.30 a.m. About 20 minutes later, the Dasher comes out and yells for Julie to come in. And that's when he saw Whitey. He also corroborated Abe's story about the dumping of the car. On May 17th, the state rested his case and asked for the death penalty for Dasher and Happy, if found guilty. The defense brought 14 of Happy's relatives, who testified that he never left his grandmother's side the whole night. Under cross-examination, Happy said he never met with Relis in the tombs, and Julie didn't work for him, he worked for Relis. Relis took over my bookmaking operation back at 37. He sent Julie to come get me. I met him at a candy store at Saratoga in Livonia, and he told me I had been bookmaking too long and to turn my business over. 
The next day, he sent Julie to pick up my accounts. Turkish was able to find holes in the defense witnesses' story. On May 23rd, 1940, Burton Turkish wrapped up his case by saying, this is a first degree murder, nothing less. Happy became red, slamming his hand on the table, saying, so Rellis told you everything, huh? Turkish asked for the death penalty and the case was given to the jury. On Thursday, May 23rd, 1940, a jury found Harry Happy Mayon and Frank the Dasher Abandando guilty of first degree murder. On May 28th, they were sentenced to die in the electric chair. The next trial to take place was Bugsy and Pep for the murder of Puggy Feinstein. It was set for June, but it had to be postponed to September because the judge wanted to see if Pep was fit to stand trial. You see, Pep had a strategy to get out of this whole thing. He decided the only way out was to plea insanity. After all, who would believe that a sane person would be capable of doing the things that he was being accused of? Pep stopped washing and refused to let the prison barber near him. He grew a beard to prove that he was crazy. All that it proved was that Pep could grow a beard. Pep appeared at the preliminary hearings in a turtleneck sweater. And when Bugsy was placed next to him for transport to court, he said, you disgust me to even look at. Pep kept his crazy roll up in the courtroom. He stared off and would not respond when his name was called. And when he got back to Raymond Street Jail, he would yell and tell the guards that someone is in the cell trying to kill him. I know who it is, and they'll be back tonight. No one believed his act, and the trial was set for September 9th. On June 9th, Abe's wife gave birth to a baby girl under police protection at the hospital. In August, William O'Dwyer agreed to lend his prize canaries to the DA in Los Angeles to tell what they knew about the murder of Big Greeny Greenberg. An airplane was chartered, but the pilot was not told who was aboard until they were over Harrisburg, PA. Abe and TikTok talked to the Los Angeles DA, and Allie told him that Big Harry was on the run from Lepke, and that Mickey Sykoff was supposed to handle the job, but he disappeared. So Ben volunteered to deal with his old friend. On Thanksgiving 1939, Big Harry was shot by Frankie Carbo, and Ben drove his own car as a crash car in a getaway. Abe and TikTok flew back to Brooklyn. They had a gift for William O'Dwyer, a sombrero. They said thanks, the trip was like a vacation. On September 10th, the jury was set for Pep and Bugsy for the murder of Puggy Feinstein. The judge ordered Pep shorn. The first to take the stand were Puggy's friends, the guys who went with Puggy to the corner that evening. They remained in the car while Puggy went to the corner and asked about Tiny. They said he returned and said, this guy said he knows what Tiny is. I gotta go see this guy, I'll catch up with you later. He never did. After a while, the pair went looking for Puggy. They went to all the pool halls and bars in Brooklyn, and then they went back to Puggy's neighborhood, Borough Park, and still couldn't find him. The next day they did the same, still no Puggy. While driving past Midnight Roses, one of the men recognized Bugsy Goldstein and said, that's Bugsy Goldstein, I recognize him from the crap game, maybe he knows what happened. The young man approached Bugsy and said, hi, you don't know me, but I recognize you from the craps game, you're Bugsy, right? Yeah, what of it? We're looking for our friend. We saw him here last, and he told us he was going to meet us later, but we haven't seen him. Skinny guy, goes by the name of Puggy. Bugsy said, Puggy? I don't know no Puggy, and turned and walked away. The young man knew not to press the issue. They said it wasn't until later that evening, when they read the newspapers, that they found out what happened to Puggy. During the proceedings, Pep just stared off, seemingly not interested in what was going on. Dookie took the stand and told the jury that he was just sitting reading the comic when Bugsy came up to him and say, we gotta drive this guy around for a while, we need your car. He told her the death of Puggy and how Bugsy got into the back with Puggy while he drove the car. He told how Bugsy couldn't find the dump that Pep had told him to cremate the body in. The flatland dump always had a fire going and would have been an ideal place to burn the body, but Bugsy wasn't familiar with the flatlands and he just couldn't find it. One flat bush lot is as good as any. He also told how when Bugsy lit the match, a fireball singed his eyebrows. Abe took the stand on September 16th, prepared to give the statements that would get his best friends killed. The Happy and Dasher thing was different. Him and Happy never really liked each other. It was more of a business thing. But these two had been with him since the beginning. Before the beginning, in fact. He was cutting school with Bugsy as kids. They killed for him, he killed for them, and they were willing to die for each other if caught. Well, here he was, about to become the thing he hated the most, a rat. He took the stand, avoiding eye contact with his old pals, and talked for five and a half hours. He named Albert Anastasia as the one who told Pep that Puggy had to go. And he also said that this was an order from Vince Mangano. 
Puggy had started a bookmaking operation in Mangano's area without consent. Abe told of how him and Pep were having no success finding Puggy until that day Puggy found them. He told of how a plan was devised to get Puggy back to Abe's house. He said that he instructed Bugsy to ride Puggy around in Dookie's car for an hour and then bring him back to his house. He said that they knew that they would be the last people seen with Puggy, so Pep went to Albert Anastasia's house to get permission to take Puggy off of the corner. Abe went to his house and gave his wife and Bugsy's wife, who was visiting at the time, money for a movie. And then he sent his mother-in-law to bed. When Pep got to his house, they pushed the chair next to the door, and Pep would sit slumped so no one could see him when they walked in. Abe told how Puggy was able to squirm free and bite Pep on the ham, causing the hardened killer to cry out like a baby. He said Pep got angry at Bugsy for not securing his end of the rope. He also said that after loading Puggy's body into Dookie's car, Pep said, That bum bit me. I might get locked, y'all. Do you have any Mercura Chrome? Abe went and retrieved the bottle from the bathroom and applied it to the big bad man's finger. During Abe's testimony, Pep would stare off or trace things with his finger. Bugsy sat biting his lip. But the next day would be the worst for Bugsy. The next day, one of his closest pals, Seymour Blue Jaw Magoon, an Irishman that Bugsy brought into the gang. The two even roomed together when they were on the run in a wallpaper and union case. When Seymour entered the courtroom, Bugsy put his hands together and said, Our life depends on you telling the truth. Unfortunately for Bugsy and Pep, that's what Seymour did. Blue Jaw told the story of the night Puggy was cooked. He said he was headed to Midnight Roses when Bugsy jumped out of Dookie's car and onto his running board. He had an empty gas can in his hand and I told him not to put that in the car because it would smell of like gas. Bugsy put the can in the back and hopped in. Bugsy told Seymour that he and Dookie had just burned a guy and they needed to return the gas can and pay the attendant. Seymour asked who. Bugsy said some guy named Puggy. Seymour said I don't know him and I don't care. He told Bugsy you should pay for the can but don't return it. It could have fingerprints. Seymour told how he took Bugsy to the gas station and then dumped the can before meeting Abe Rellis and Pep for lobster. Pep was complaining about being bitten and getting locked jaw. At the end of his testimony, Bugsy cried out, That's a tough story. There's a girl in the spaghetti house. That man's burning me. It only took the jury an hour and a half to find the pair guilty of first degree murder. During the reading of the verdict, Bugsy raised his hand like an elementary student and asked the judge could he speak. The judge said no. Bugsy said, I really need to say something. There will be time for statements later, the judge said. Bugsy blurted out, I want to thank the jury for doing a good job with the evidence they were given. The next week, the pair were given a mandatory death penalty. At this hearing, Bugsy again wanted to speak. This time he said, I want to thank the court for the charge he made sending us to our death. And I only hope the same applies for you and your family. I would like to do one thing before I die. I would like to pee up your honor's leg. Judge Fitzgerald, who was hard of hearing, asked him to repeat the statement. He did. The judge still couldn't hear. He asked the bailiff, what did he say? He said he would like to urinate on your honor's trousers. Bugsy finished his rant by saying, I ask for no pleas. I'm willing to die like a man. I was found guilty on perjured evidence, and if I have to die, I'll die like a man. Martin Bugsy Goldstein and Harry Pittsburgh Phil Strauss took the train up to Sing Sing to join Happy Mayon and Frank Abandando as they awaited their day in the chair. Happy and Adasha appealed their case and were given a new trial, but it would be the same outcome. This time, during Abe's cross-examination, he was asked, aren't you doing the same thing that Whitey did that got him killed? Abe squirmed in his chair and he said, that's different. As Abe was leaving the stand, Happy grabbed the water glass from in front of him and threw it at Abe, but it crashed to the floor feet away from him. Happy yelled, I'll rip your goddamn throat out. Abe just smiled. Happy was ordered back into his seat by the judge. They were found guilty again, and again they were sentenced to die in the electric chair. Even though Happy and the Dash's trial was first, because they were retried, this made Bugsy and Pep the first to face the chair. After all appeals were exhausted, June 12th was set as the date of execution. That morning, Pep and Bugsy were shaved and prepared for the execution. Pep was supposed to go first, but Bugsy broke down in the cell and he shouted that he couldn't stand it anymore and he wanted to die right away. He shouted, he knew the governor would not give him a break. He refused to see his family and his last meal. He wanted that given to Happy and the Dasher. Rabbi Joseph Kratz, the prison Jewish chaplain, was at his side. He remained silent in the death chamber. He squeezed his eyes and squirmed until a switch was thrown. Pep Strauss, on the other hand, dropped the crazy act. He met with his sister and two of his brothers and his girl, 
Evelyn Middleman, the Kiss of Death girl. Shortly after 11 p.m., Pep Strauss, who had been pinned with 28 murders, swaggered to the chair like he was headed to a booth in Roses. He looked around the execution chamber, and then the switch was thrown. Whenever somebody was executed in the electric chair, Sing Sing, lights in the death house would dim. Happy in the dash, saw the lights dimming, and they knew that they were next. The whole time this thing is going on, Abe and the rest of the squealers were staying at the Half Moon Hotel in Coney Island. Abe was how you say it, a disgusting pig. He refused to shower and loved forcing the guards and the other squealers to smell his odors anytime they were in his presence. He was also sick and he believed he had cancer. He would hack up blood into his hand and show it to others like TikTok who said he couldn't stand to be around him. TikTok said Abe would spit the blood into a glass and wait for it to get full before he emptied it. He was especially a pain in the ass to his guards, or rather, the police tasked with guarding the stoolies. He wanted them to taste his food, just in case someone was trying to poison him. And when they went for court dates, he would duck behind them. He expected them to take a bullet for him. He was the star. Abe was the only person Abe cared about. He had been taken to a hospital to stay for a few days so doctors could check him out. It was found that Abe had bronchitis and not cancer. On November 11th, Rose Rellis came to meet with her husband at the Half Moon Hotel. They were heard arguing for an hour before Rose left in a fury. The next day, Burton Turkis received a phone call. The voice on the other end said, Abe just went out the window. On the morning of November 12th, 1941, a guard made his rounds at 7 a.m. and he saw Abe in his bed asleep. Between 7 a.m. and 7.10 a.m., Abe tied a length of wire to the radiator next to his window. The wires were brought into the suite a few weeks earlier and given to the men to use as antennas for the radios. Abe tied the other end of the wire to two bed sheets and lowered himself down to the fifth floor window beneath his room. He had his feet on the windowsill, one hand holding the bed sheet, the other working the screen in the lock of the window. The screen was raised five to six inches and the lock was turned halfway. At some point, his foot slipped and his weight caused the wire to come loose and Abe fell landing in a seated position, fracturing his spine, and dying almost instantly. O'Dwyer got out of his sickbed to come down there. There would be hell to pay. You'd better get your story straight, he said to the officer who he had handpicked to lead the guards. He ordered that no reporters be told what happened. Abe was fully dressed, pants, jacket, shirt, and a cap in his back pocket. His wife was sent for, and she was told that Abe wanted to see her. When she got to the hotel, she was told what happened and burst into tears. O'Dwyer had Abe's body turned over and examined for bullet holes or stab wounds. They found none. It was then that O'Dwyer ordered one photo to be taken of the body. Only one. And one from the window. That's why we only had one photo of Abe on that day. But why? Why would Abe want to escape? He was as safe as he was going to be under the eye of the cops. He only had a few bucks in his pocket. Where was he going? The final report on his death came out a few years later. It concluded that Relis was trying to play a trick on the guards by escaping and coming back up to the sixth floor to make the cops look silly, and that he died of mischief. He did have the key to his room in his pocket, and that was against the rules handed down by his wire, but what the hell was he doing? Some will say that he was thrown out of the window, but he had scuffs on the inside of his shoes that matched the scrapes on his fifth floor window sill. So I do think that he was trying to get into the fifth floor window, but why? And how did he know that the room underneath him was vacant? Some said that he had a stash of the gang's money and he was the only one who knew where it was. So many questions and all the answers went out the window with Abe. The underworld breathed a sigh of relief. But Abe's early morning flight will come too late to save Happy and the Dasher. They were already scheduled to die. It didn't help Lepke, Mendy Weiss or Louis Capone either. It was the testimony of TikTok that doomed them. Abe was just a corroborating witness. Lepke said it couldn't have happened to a better guy when he was told about Abe's death. Abe's death did make the big greeny Greenberg case go away for Ben Siegel, but the one who got away was Albert Anastasia. Abe was set to testify before a grand jury that Albert Anastasia planned the murder of Morris Diamond. On February 19, 1942, Happy Mayon was visited by Mildred Morrow, described as a family friend, his brother-in-law, and his niece Fanny. Frank's cousins, Josephine and Elizabeth Stamola came to say goodbye. After 18 months on death row and watching the lights dim for 20 men, including two friends, it was the Dash's turn to take the ride in Old Sparky. 
the dash had kissed the crucifix, and at 12.05 a.m., February 20th, the switch was thrown. Two minutes later, Happy Two kissed the crucifix, offered by Reverend Bernard Martin, and again, the switch was thrown. And that was it. The five men responsible for close to 100 deaths were gone. In the early 40s, Rose Gold sold Midnight Roses. And as for the rest of the gang, Dookie and Pretty were given suspended sentences after pleading guilty to petty larceny and the theft of an automobile used in the murder. In October 1950, Dookie would be arrested at the age of 37 for grand larceny as a member of a nationwide auto theft ring. On March 7, 1951, Dookie disappeared. He missed the court date and was presumed dead. On June 21, 1940, Big Ganji Cohn was acquitted for the murder of Walter Sage. He returned to Hollywood, where he would have a career as an extra until the 1960s. Jack Drucker was still on the run until he was arrested in Delaware by the FBI in 1944. He was found guilty of second-degree murder and was given 25 years to life. He would die in Attica Prison, January 1962. Max the Jerk Gollum was allowed to plead guilty to second-degree murder for the killing of Spider Murtha, and he was given five years. There would be no new king of Brownsville. The neighborhood would be absorbed into the Italian rum mob, with many of the Ocean Hill members joining actual mafia families. And that, my friends, is the story of Murder Incorporated. I hope you guys enjoyed the story as much as I enjoyed telling it. I hope you learned something that you didn't already know. I know that I did. Even though I gave you guys almost three hours of info, it's still a lot left. I still left a lot out. Honestly, this Murder Incorporated thing could have been seven or eight episodes. But stay tuned. I'm going to be doing a few follow-up videos on some of the guys that I didn't get too deep into, like, like Vito Guarino. I left some stuff about him out on purpose. So stay tuned. I haven't picked the date for the live stream yet, but I'll be doing that so we can talk about the Brownsville boys and, and any, any other thing you want to talk about. Okay? So, again, the gang is 20,000 strong. Thank you so much. If you're new here, make sure you bump off that subscribe button, break that thumb, and ring that bell. All right? This has been A Few Bad Men. Keep your nose clean, and don't take any wooden nickels. I'll see you in the funnies.